Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to uh, start at this time. Uh, welcome to the first uh, talk of the session. And uh, please welcome uh, Ruven Lerner, and he's going to be presenting Practical Decorators. Hey, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to PyCon. Pretty exciting stuff. So uh, my name is Ruven. And I have a fantastic job. I help people get better at Python. I do that a few different ways. I have a newsletter that about 10,000 people get every week. I do corporate Python training. I go on site all around the world. I have a service called Weekly Python Exercise. I do online video courses. Earlier this week, my book was published by Manning. Note, this is the first Manning book to have the author's picture on the cover. <laughs> and this morning, uh, the episode of Talk Python with me was also released. So I can annoy you in all media all day. So we're going to talk about decorators. Let's decorate a function. Let's say I have this decorator here. So what do I have? I have at my deco. I should add, by the way, this is an advanced talk. So if things seem a little weird, hard, difficult, that's OK. After a little while, I promise within 20 years, it'll make a lot of sense. <laughs> so basically, if I want to decorate a function, I say at my deco. And then I'm going to say def add of a and b, return a plus b. Pretty reasonable. And this is the standard syntax we use for decorators in Python. But when you see this on the left, you really need to be thinking something different. You need to be thinking, first, I'm, de I'm defining my function. Now, what does def do in Python? It actually does two different things. It creates a function object, and it also um, assigns that object to the variable add, to the identifier add. So you always need to be thinking that's doing those two different things. Well, right after I define my function, that at my deco on the left does something really kind of wild. It then does a reassignment. It says, actually, what we're going to do is we're going to call my deco with an argument of add, and we're going to assign the result back to the variable add. It's a little switcheroo there. This means that we could, if we really want to, write it like on the right. But that would be really annoying, because then I have to write the word add three different times. And no one wants to do that. And that's just super annoying. If you mess it up even once, bad news. So while the left-hand side has perhaps more magic in it, and it's less explicit as to what's going on, it saves us time, it saves us energy, and it saves us from having to perhaps make those mistakes. The thing is, when we do this, we have three callables in this code, this seemingly simple call code has three different callables. Now, what's a callable? Callable is fancy Python speak for something we can execute. If you've ever tried to say, like, five parentheses in Python, what happens? There's no compiler to tell you, hey, you can't execute five. You can't execute integers. Instead, what happens is at runtime, Python tries to execute. It says, wait a second, integers are not callable. You can't do that. Well, how does it know? Well, certain things in Python are callable, and that's typically going to be functions and classes. So we actually have three callables, either functions or classes here. For most of this talk, I'm going to be talking about functions. Toward the end, we'll talk about classes as well. So where are these callables going to be? Well, first of all, we have the decorated function. right? That is our first callable, add. The second callable is the decorator itself. And the third callable, and here is where this syntax gets a little weird, the third callable, which is really the most important one, is actually invisible here. It's the one that's returned from when I call my deco on add. And that callable is the one assigned back to add. And so when I call add, I'm not really calling my original add. I'm calling whatever was returned by my deco add, which then is going to sort of hopefully call, a, a call the original add. So this is how we have to think about our decorators when we use them. Well, what about when we want to define them then? We're going to have to deal with these three callables. And so a very typical way to, run our, or to write our decorator is as a function inside of another function. So I have here my deco. That's my decorator, is on the top level there. That's the function. And it's going to get a function. It's going to get our uh, function here as an argument. The inside function here, which is often called wrapper, that's where a lot of the magic is happening. That's what's going to actually be returned, as we can see here. And notice that it has a funny sort of function signature. It's getting splat args and double splat kw args. Why am I doing that? Because I want to be able to decorate any function at all. And this way, I can get any combination of arguments coming in. And then what am I going to do? I'm going to call the function, just pass those along. So whatever I get as input, I'm going to pass along to output. Now, this decorator is pretty boring. All it does is it takes any function whatsoever, it calls that function, sticks the result of the function into a string, and then adds three exclamation points afterwards. OK, not the most exciting function in the world. Um, so what's going on here? Let's once again talk about our three callables. We have our first callable, which is our decorated function. It becomes our argument. 
The second callable is our decorator that we are calling on it. And the third callable, that sort of mystery one at the end, that's wrapper. That's the internal function. When whatever is called on my deco add, this function then returns and is assigned back to our original function name. And that's how the decorator sort of works. Here's another perspective on it. We can think about it in terms of time. We can say that at the beginning, when we decorate the function, this outside function is running. But in the inside function runs once each time we run the function. So the outside one runs once only at setup time, and the inside run one runs as many times as we need. That's pretty great. By the way, I should add, how is it that the internal function is having access to func? Func, after all, is a local variable in the external function. This is thanks to the magic of Python scoping, L-E-G-B, local and closing global built-ins. Basically, what happens is that inside of wrapper, it looks for the name func. It says, is there a local variable func? There is not. So let's look in the enclosing function. Hey, what do you know? There's a local variable func there. Let's use that. So we have access to that external function inside of the internal function. Well, decorators are pretty cool then. That's pretty great. And you know, for a long time, I thought they were cool, but I also thought they were sort of a solution looking for a problem. Like, OK, I can now twist my mind in all sorts of different ways, but really and truly, where would I want to use them? Well, it turns out they are actually useful. Shocking, right? They are actually useful. So I want to give you about five different examples of decorators and how we can use them, how we can think about them. And I want you not only then to understand how decorators work and how we can write them, but sort of the perspective that decorators give us on how things work in Python. And you'll start to see more and more opportunities to use them as you sort of deepen your understanding. And so a classic example to start with decorators is timing. Right? So how long does it take a function to run? Well, I can do that in general. Right? I can use time.time, .time, get back the number of seconds since the 1st of January 1970. I can do that before I run the function. I can then run the function. Then I can run it again, run time.time, .time, and I can subtract the two numbers there and find out how long the function took to run. And indeed, then, I can do that in my decorator. So here's my decorator. I've got my outside function, which I'm calling log time. It's going to take func as an argument. And my inside function, what's it going to do? Well, the important thing here is going to be start time equals time.time. .time. Right, so I'm going to time it. I'm then going to run the function. Notice, I'm not doing anything to the function at all. It's running as per usual. I'm going to pass it all of its arguments. It's going to return a result. Excuse me, I'm going to just put the result inside of the variable cleverly called result. And then afterwards, I'm going to find out how much time has elapsed. Then I'm going to write it to a file. I'm going to say, you know, with open timing.txt and granted, timelog.txt granted here, I'm hard coding the name. We don't need to do that. I'm using A to append it, to append to the file as opposed to reset it each time. And I'm going to write what is the current time, what function name am I running, and how long did this function take to run? Fantastic. And if I do this, right, here's how I can apply it. So I can apply my decorator very easily. I can just say at log time to slow add and at log time to slow mull. And by the way, one of the beautiful things about decorators is I can add and remove their functionality to functions by not touching the function itself, just by putting the decorator before it. So if I want to start timing a bunch of functions, I can just put at log time before their definitions. And when I'm done timing them, I can just remove that. I don't need to touch the functions themselves. They stay exactly the same. Well, what happens when I run my function, slow add and slow model a couple of times? This is the sort of result I'm going to get in the file. I'm going to find out at what time each of the functions ran. I'm going to find out which function ran. I'm going to find out how long it ran for. And so I can add this sort of logging of my functions with pretty you know, great ease. OK, well, what was going on here is, of course, I have my original decorated function. Still, I have my three callables. Something just fall? No worries, no worries. Yes, mm. <laughs> ominous. <laughs> All right, and then I've got log time. There's my decorator. And then I've got the return value from log time func is assigned back to func's name. Fantastic. OK, so that's a pretty simple decorator, but it demonstrates some of the ideas. So let's get a little more complicated. Let's say I have a function that's very expensive to run in terms of the resources it uses, in terms of the timing it takes, in terms of all sorts of different stuff. So maybe I want to make sure this function can only run once per minute. If it runs more than once per minute, then I want to get an exception back. So how am I going to do that? Well, here's a skeleton of my decorator. I'm going to call it once per minute, very clever name. Right? And I'm going to have func be its argument. And so we see here, once again, I have my decorated function. I have the decorator, and we're going to return it. Uh, yeah, but what goes in the middle? 
OK, that's left as an exercise to the reader. OK, no, no, no. So basically, what are we going to do here? Well, think about it. Each time a function runs, it doesn't remember what happened in the previous runs. That's sort of the whole point of a function. And it's not like in some languages where we have, pardon the obscenity, static variables, where we would be able to carry these variables over from one run to another. So I can't really do that. Now, I could use a global variable right, to keep track of this stuff, but then I'd feel super icky and have to shower each time I ran my code. So I really got to find some other better way to do this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use non-local. I'm going to put the time, the last invoke time, in the outer function, the one that runs just once. And it's going to set up this variable once. Then I'm going to say non-local. Now, what does non-local do? It says to Python, listen, normally when you assign to a variable inside of a function, you are either creating or updating a local variable. Not this time. By saying non-local, we say, I want you to update, change, the variable in the external, in the enclosing scope. So now what's happening is that each time I run wrapper, my internal function, it's going to say non-local last invoked, and then it's going to say, I'm going to update that external variable. I'm going to update that enclosing variable. And this way, we're able to carry this information across different runs of our function. Pretty great. OK, now I need that. I need non-local because this stuff is executing only once. We know that last invoked is only going to run once in our function, in our decorated function, whereas this stuff is going to be running again and again and again each time we run our function. And does this actually work? I sure hope so, because I put it in my slides. So we're going to say add 2 plus 2. And sure enough, that's 4. That's for the you know, mathematically not inclined. I'm giving you the answer here. But then if I say add of 3 and 3, well, I ran that too often, called too often error, only four seconds have passed. Pretty great. Yeah, but who wants just once per minute? Let's generalize this to once per n. Now what I want to do is restrict people to run my function once per n seconds. So in order to understand what's going on here, we're going to have to go back to what happens with a decorator. So when I see this at once per minute on def add a and b return a plus b, remember, we should be thinking this. Def add of a and b return a plus b, our function is defined as per usual. But of course, the rewrite means that on that last line, what we're going to be doing is taking the decorator name once per minute, applying it to add, and whatever we get back, we're going to put into add. So what happens when I add an argument to my decorator? Right now, I'm saying at once per n of 5, and then I do def add of a and b. So what do we need to be thinking? We need to be thinking, OK, I've got my function definition as before, and then I have this on the bottom line. Right? So what am I doing? I'm going to call once per n with an argument of 5. The result from that is then going to be applied to add. The result from that is then going to be assigned back to add. In other words, we have four callables running around here. All right, so what do we have? We have our original decorated function. We have our decorator once per n. We have the result from calling once per n on 5, because that's a call, but we can then invoke that on add. And then the result from once per n on 5 on add is assigned back to add. Well, that's great, but how are we going to actually implement this? That's right. A function in a function in a function. <laughs> so. What's this going to look like? I'm going to have once per n on the outside there. That's going to be my top level function. That's what's going to get my argument. I'm then going to have a middle function, and that's going to get the actual function. You can think of these outer two functions as sort of splitting up the responsibilities of our original outer function before. And wrapper looks pretty much the same as before. In fact, we can see what we had before. We have last invoked equals 0, non-local last invoked, because once again, we want to update that variable in closing scope. Right? So I'm doing basically the same thing as before. I've just switched things around a little bit so that the outer function becomes two different functions. And why do I want to do that? Because I need to have the decorated function here, not at the outer level, but in the middle level. And then I want to have the decorator itself there that takes the argument. And then I'm going to have the return values from each of my other functions. And the combination of the four different decorators here gives me exactly what I want. And we can think about this once again in terms of time, that this outer function, outermost function, runs once when we get the argument. The second function executes once when we decorate the function. And once again, our wrapper, our middle function, runs as many times as we want to invoke our function. And once we do this, well, does this work? Now I'm going to run it, right? Slow out of 2 and 2 and slow out of 3 and 3. And I put a limit there of, I think it was 5 seconds. So now I'm going to get 4 once again. And now, once again, I'm going to get an error because too little time has passed. But now that timing is variable. So I can say this function can only run every minute. But that function can run every 2 minutes. And this function can run every 30 seconds, whatever I want. OK, another example. Memoization, not memorization. 
that would be easy to spell and say. Instead, it's memoization, which is one of these things you learn about in computer science class and then forget, unless you're a you know, nasty instructor like me. And memoization actually is not a new technique at all. I just looked it up to find out. It's more than 50 years old. Um, and the idea is basically, if I have a function whose arguments always lead to the same value, always lead to the same result. So think of basic mathematical functions, you know, adding and multiplying and dividing, all that. If I add two and two, the next time I add two and two, it had better be four once again. It's not going to change on me unless we've got some really big problems. So basically, wouldn't it be nice if every time I would take a look at my arguments, and if I've seen these arguments before for this function, just return the cached value from the previous time? Why run the function? Now, it's pretty stupid to do this for addition and multiplication, I admit. But if you have something a little harder, a little longer, right, even take like, you know, SHA-1 or RSA or something like that, you know, then you might want to actually do this sort of caching. So how are we going to do this? Well, I'm going to define memoize. That's going to be my decorator. It's going to take a function. And right up there at the top, I'm going to define a cache. How are we going to cache something in uh, Python? I'm going to use a dictionary, because we love dictionaries, and we'll use them wherever we possibly can. Um, so basically, what's going to happen here? I'm going to set up my cache to be a dictionary. I'm then going to take a look at splat args. Well, args is defined to be a tuple. And so I can say, hey, take a look at these arguments. Have we seen these arguments before? If not, let's run the function with all the arguments, take the results, stick it into our dictionary, and then I know after running this if statement, no matter what, I have the result from this function. Fancy, huh? So now I can take the decorated function, I've got the decorator, I'm returning it back, everything is great, and indeed, if I want to think about it, Right? In terms of my timing thing, this is running once, and this is running multiple times. And you might be saying, wait a second, didn't he say we have to use non-local if we're accessing variables in the outer scope? And indeed, I did say that sort of kind of almost. Basically, if I'm assigning to the variable in the external scope, in the enclosing scope, then I have to worry about it. But if I'm just saying cache square brackets, then I'm accessing the variable I don't need to worry about. It. So long as I'm not saying cache equals, I'm all set, I don't need to use non-local. So actually, this works pretty well. Let's take a look, just in case. So we'll do memoize of add. And notice here that my add and multiple, uh, multiply mul functions are going to say when they're running, right? They're going to sort of declare to the world, because that's what we want to do when we add numbers, find out the computer is adding numbers, because it's a pretty rare operation. So now I'm going to say add of 3 and 7 and mul of 3 and 7. I'm going to do each of those twice. So the first time, we're going to see then that when I add, look, memoize notices that I haven't gotten this back before, so I'd better run the function. Then I run the function, and then I get the result back. And then mul, once again, right, it's going to be the same sort of thing, caching the new value, running mul. And now the second time I run add, it's going to say, wait, I already have that result. I'm not going to run the function at all. So it just sidesteps the function altogether. And the same thing is true for mul. And notice then, even though I have exactly the same arguments here, because it's separate functions, they have different decorators. Different decorators means that their caches are completely separate from one another. I don't need to worry about them stepping on one another. That's pretty great, but some of you are probably saying, wait a second. What if args contains a non-hashable value? And what about kwargs? You just ignored it, and that's hurting its feelings, and kwargs does not take kindly to that. So what should I do about that? Well, I could cry. Or I can remember that we've got pickle, and pickle gets me out of this pickle, as it were. Pickle basically says, I'm going to take a Python data structure and turn it into a string or into a byte string. And byte strings are, of course, hashable. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pickle args, I'm going to pickle kw args, I'm going to stick them into a tuple, because I can stick them into a tuple, and then I'm going to use those as my cache key. So now I'm going to take args and kw args, cache, put each of them in pickle, use that, and I'm going to say, hey, have we seen this before? And then every unique combination of args and kw args is being cached, and then I can check for that, and then we'll always return the caching of t. Last example, attributes. So attributes are, of course, what we have on all sorts of objects in Python, but especially when we're dealing with classes and objects. So methods are attributes on the class. And um, every time we create an instance and we have dunder init, on dunder init, I'm going to set all sorts of uh, data, data there. What if I want to have a whole bunch of different classes that have the same attribute, especially the same method? Well, you might say, oh, well, obviously, then, I should use inheritance. Yeah, but inheritance is only uh, really appropriate when the objects are similar, when the classes are similar to one another. If I very distinct classes, but I still want them to have similar behavior, then it's not so easy. So I could do it, whoops, I could do it with, right, with attributes, uh, I could do it with inheritance, and I could even use multiple inheritance now. The only problem with multiple inheritance is, as you know, there are two opinions about multiple inheritance. Some people think that it's terrible, and some people think it's the worst thing ever created on Earth. So, <laughs> 
So no matter where you stand on this debate, I think we can sort of sidestep it and say, fine, let's just assume we're not going to use inheritance at all. How can I use a decorator to basically add this sort of thing? So here I have my wrapper, my better wrapper. I must say one of the things that I most love about uh, data classes in Python 3.7 is that the wrapper is improved, so it's actually usable. The current wrapper is, like, well, not so great. So here I'm going to define fancy wrapper, and it's going to return a string that says I'm a whatever, type self, with vars of var self. Fantastic. So how am I going to decorate my class then to get this? Well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to define better wrapper of C. OK, and so C is going to be a class. Notice, now I'm decorating a class. But it's a callable, so who cares? It's fine. So here I've got my class. Here's my decorator. And what am I going to have inside? Well, I'm going to assign C dunder wrapper equals fancy wrapper. I'm changing the method inside the class. Great. And of course, I'm going to return wrapper because I have to return a callable. But you might be thinking, wait a second, this wrapper is doing nothing. That's OK. There are lots of people who do nothing, and we don't complain about them too much. So basically, I've got wrapper here. And wrapper takes args and kwargs, and all we do is then pass it along to the class and return the new object. Really, what I can do is just this. I can define better wrapper. It'll take the class. I'll add the new method to it, and then I'll just return the class. Right? Nothing wrong with that. And indeed, that works just fine. Here's my decorated class. Here's my decorator. Here's my callable. I don't need a function there. And does this work? Yeah, this works great. Right? Because now if I print f, what am I going to get? I'm a foo with vars x10 and y10, 20, 30. Fantastic. Well, that was great for setting a class attribute, like a method here. Can we do that for instances, of course? Can we do that for object instances also? Of course we can. It's Python. We can do anything. Um, the world is putty in our fingers. So basically, what can I do? I'm going to give every object, every new instance, its own birthday. Everyone deserves a birthday, including objects. So when I use the object birthday decorator, I'm going to add a new attribute here to each and every instance. And it's just going to be the timestamp at which we created the object. So what's going to happen? Well, object birthday, that's going to be my decorator. Notice here I'm not doing anything to the class. I'm not modifying the class. When do we have an, act, uh, an opportunity to touch the instance? Well, remember that a decorator runs in two different stages. It runs when we create, when we decorate the object, and the inside stuff wrapper runs every time we execute the callable. Well, every time I execute the class, that means every time I create a new instance of the class, right? So wrapper is going to run each time I have a new instance. And when we have a new instance, now I'm actually going to use that syntax that I had before. I'm going to call the class with args and kwargs. I'm going to get a new object back. Then I'm going to stick a new uh, attribute onto that object. What is it going to be? It's going to be created at time.time. .time. And then I'm going to return the object. And here I have my decorated class. Here I have my decorator. Here I have what I'm returning. All is great. And indeed, if I run it now, if I have object birthday with class foo, print f, well, now I've got my original wrapper. And print the birthday created at. Fantastic. I've got the number of seconds since the 1st of January 1970. Let's do both. I'm going to define here a decorator that modifies the class to take a new method and modifies the object to get a new attribute. And here, I'm modifying the class. And here, I'm modifying the object. And I can do both inside of the same decorator because we think of these two different stages at which things run. So decorators are pretty cool and pretty exciting. First of all, decorators let's dry up our callables. Dry is this idea, don't repeat yourself. You don't want the same code to be happening more than once in your software. And I don't know about you, but on several occasions, OK, many occasions, too many occasions in my software career, I'd be like, you know, I'm just going to copy this code. What are the chances that I'll have to modify it in both places down the road? I can tell you right now, 100%. There's a 100% chance you will end up modifying the code in both places. Don't do it. And so if I can take code out of multiple functions, multiple classes that's the same and put into a decorator, I will be saving myself time down the road. Also, understanding how callables work is really central to this, and it allows us to see how this all works together. Understanding how many callables are involved in our decorators, it lets us pick apart the decorator and say, oh, I'm going to take advantage of this part versus this part versus this part, and really play with it in different ways. Decorators make it dramatically easier to do all sorts of different things. Um, basically, it lowers the bar to messing around with our functions and our objects in all sorts of different ways. And you could argue maybe that's a problem, right? But in Python, we like to give people opportunity to do things. And things that previously required all sorts of black magic, like meta classes, now we could just do with decorators that are much more understandable. And all this depends on the fact that in Python, functions and classes are just plain old objects. They're objects that everyone can use. They can pass them around, that they can be returned. Right? And so that lends itself to this amazing, amazing sort of behavior that we can take advantage of in all sorts of different ways. Um, if you want, 
thanks to the magic of the internet, I think this should now be working. You can go to practicaldecorators.com and get the code and the slides from this talk. Um, I'd be, I think we have a few minutes for questions as well. I have a booth here for weekly Python exercise. You can email me. You can get me on Twitter. I'd be happy to uh, talk to you after this about this or anything else. Thanks very much. At this point, if uh, is this on? yeah, is it, at this point, if you have any questions, please line up at the microphones and ask the questions. I, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. You, you are still good. Raise your hand. Oh, we have five minutes. So we have five minutes for questions. So if people have questions, problems, personal problems they want to share, um, I'm I'm open to it all. Yeah, please. So you were talking before about the enclosing scopes, um, and. How is the enclosing scopes, the way Python handles it, different from the concept of like closures in JavaScript and other programming languages? So it's basically the same idea, right? Like ba basically the idea then that um, the enclosing function stack frame sticks around even when the enclosing function does not stick around is exactly what allows us to do this. But like, you know, clo basically what I'm, what I'm teaching this sort of stuff with inner functions, I'll be like, inner function, inner function, by the way, this is known as a closure. And okay. you'll have like a third of the people go, oh, and the other people say, huh? So it sort of depends on who learned Lisp okay, and who so did not. Okay, so it's 100% the same. It, it should be. As okay. far as I know, it's 100% the same. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, yeah, please. Hi, uh, thank you. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I wanted to ask if you have any tips or gotchas when it comes to writing tests for decorators. Oh, I'm sure I do, and I can't think of any offhand. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. When have you found it d uh, beneficial or detrimental to use functools.wraps? Oh, so um, as you might be able to tell, I'm a dinosaur. And so um, that's actually very, like, basically every software, I'm like, oh, I should probably use functools.wraps, because it does a lot of this stuff sort of for you that you don't need to play with it. I, I must admit that I'm not as familiar with it as I should be. But it's, the idea is basically to lower the bar even more and make it easier to do some of this stuff so you don't need to be thinking in all these different scopes. Yeah, please. Hi. Um, so from the Zen of Python, flat is better than nested. And from like the three, ne the three nested functions, that sort of goes against it. Um, do you have any thoughts about using functools partial to sort of get rid of those nests? Or have you experimented with that? So I'll tell you, I really like the idea of functools partial. It's super cool and fun. And yet, I find that for many people, it's just like extra confusing. Like it adds another layer of, wait, what do you mean partial function? <laughs> like some of it works and some of it doesn't. Um, I'll tell you, sometimes I, uh, when I introduce decorators, I use not uh, multiple functions, but I use classes. Because then you can have init. Init is sort of like the outer function. And call, under call is the inner function. And then you have this very clear separation. That's not nested, but you're like, oh, this happens once. This happens many times. Um, the problem is that you can't use class decorators to decorate certain things like methods. Um, so I'm, shall we say, partial on functools partial. <laughs> Thank you. All right, yeah. You had some pretty harsh things to say about static variables, but it's <laughs> unclear to me how sort of the variables embedded at the one-time execution step are uh, going to avoid any of the pitfalls of static variables. Uh, and I think a similar thing could be applied to multiple annotation versus multiple inheritance. All right, so for, first of all, um, I actually have nothing against static variables. Some of my best friends are static variables. No. Um, <laughs> they, uh, it's, it's, just, it's just that like, in Python, we tend to think like it's a dynamic language. So the word static tends to be something that I, I shy away from. I actually think that it would be nice and useful to have something like that available to us, but it, but it doesn't exist. Like, the best we can do is the enclosing function sort of thing. Yeah? So, um, wait, is this working? When you're uh, writing class decorators, um, how do you decide between uh, modifying attributes after they're created, modifying instances after they're created versus wrapping functions on the class like init? Uh, in, in particular, it stood out to me that you get less efficient attribute access if you're adding attributes after init has completed. Um, I couldn't tell you about the efficiency of it. Um, interesting idea. Um, I really had never thought about like, the idea of decorating in it so that you don't have to add the attributes there. Um, again, I don't have a good answer for you, but that's excellent food for thought. No more questions? Huh, I must not be in Israel. <laughs> All right, well, if people have more questions or comments, I'm happy to talk to you afterwards. And uh, thanks very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>